Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome to the 2020-2022 State Health Improvement Plan Access Work Team Meeting. This is Eregina Clay, Health Policy Analyst at the Health Policy Institute of Ohio. And we're just going to get the screen pulled up. Okay. Um, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started today. For now, everyone is in listen only mode, meaning that your line is muted. Um, we want this to be a very interactive meeting. So if you have a question, uh, please type it into the question box that you see here on your screen. If you would like to talk during today's webinar, just raise your hand and we will unmute you. If you have muted yourself, you'll need to unmute yourself for everyone else to hear your comments. Once again, make sure that you have entered your audio pin. You need to log into the webinar first before calling in order to get your pin, which is gonna be located on the right side of your screen. The slides and other meeting materials for the webinar today, including the recording, are posted here on HPIO's Shaw Ship webpage. Here we have the organizational chart of all of the stakeholders involved in the ship. As you see, the access to care team work team is located at the foundation to the far right outline in red. Now I'd like to pause and take a moment to introduce my colleagues at HPIO joining us today. In the room, we have Amy Bush Stevens, Zach Reet, Alana Clark-Kirk, and Austin Oslick. You should also be able to see the attendee list for today's webinar participants on your screen. In a moment, Amy will provide some background on the SHIP process and purpose and list out outcomes and indicators for access to care. Then we will move into some robust discussion and set the overall targets, identifying priority populations and setting priority population targets. We'll conclude today's meeting with next steps for the project. Our objective for today is that HPIO and ODH will have the guidance needed to finalize the overall targets, priority populations, and priority population targets for access to care. No final decisions will be made on the call today, but your input will guide the final decisions that are made over the next few weeks. And now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Amy, who will review the SHIP process and purpose. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first in a series of six work team we webinar calls that we're doing um, this week and next week. I'm going to start with a quick reminder about why we're here and where we're going. Here's the overall timeline for the project. And we will be delivering the final ship to the Department of Health at the end of September. We are now here in July, which is the target setting phase of the work. And later this month and into August, we'll be looking at strategies to include in the ship. Throughout this process, there's a parallel assessment happening with several touch points between the ship and the maternal and child health and maternal and infant early childhood home visiting assessment and plan, um, also known as MICV. The purpose of the ship is to get us all rowing in the same direction to improve population health in Ohio. That's why it's important for us to be concise and prioritize toward common goals. And we know that prioritization um, is challenging work, but we think it's necessary if we're gonna be strategic about the work that we're doing together to improve outcomes. The ship will be a tool to align state agencies there's a steering committee for this work that's made up of representatives, um, directors, and, and other designees from these agencies. And it's also designed to align stronger alignment and collaboration at the local level with a wide variety of local partners. 
The ship is our opportunity to track progress over time. Um, this chart sh here shows an early look at Ohio's progress on the objectives from the previous ship, the 2017-2019 ship. Um, and here green indicates things are improving, yellow indicates we've had little or no detectable change, red means things have been getting worse. So clearly we have a lot of work to do. And the goal of the ship, really the vision of this work, is um, that we get Ohio into the green. So it's really all about improvement. And the goal is to ensure that all Ohioans have the opportunity to achieve their full health potential. So this means eliminating disparities and inequities and achieving equity. Now we'll take a look at the SHIP framework um, that's guiding our work. Here we go. This is the latest version of the framework. Um, and you'll notice it looks different from the previous framework we used in the previous SHIP. We've made some changes to put a stronger focus on those community conditions and other factors listed on the left. Uh, we've also simplified some of the language and elevated equity. And the red box here in the bottom left shows us where the access to care piece fits in with this overall framework. These are the main components of the ship. Smart objectives are specific and measurable and priority populations are groups with the worst health outcomes. Um, and then we'll have evidence-based strategies and strategies to reduce disparities, inequities, racism, and discrimination. Today we're focusing here on the SMART objectives and the priority populations. Uh, and then August we'll be getting more into strategies. As a reminder, this is our objective for the call today. Now let's take a closer look at access and the outcomes and indicators that we've prioritized for access to care. As a reminder of the prioritization process we've been through so far, we started this work back in October 2018 with the regional forums uh, where we gathered local stakeholder input. Then we also looked at secondary data, and that's what's in the State Health Improvement Plan, which ODH will be releasing soon. We then shared that information with the steering committee and the advisory committee for the Sean ship. And um, then we had conversations at a June 4th advisory committee meeting where we had small, a small group discussion focused on access to care. And I'm sure some of you participated in that discussion. We then had a prioritization survey in early June. And then on June 12th, we had a webinar of this access work team. So all of the feedback gathered um, through this process has helped us to prioritize a concise set of desired outcomes and specific indicators for access to care that we're gonna take a look at in just a minute here. And before we do that, we wanna ask a quick poll question to see how many of you participated in the June 12th access work team webinar. So did you participate in that webinar? No, but you were able to watch the recording or view the slides afterwards or no? Please take a second to fill out the poll and then we'll share the results. And what we're talking about today really builds on this whole series of work. So if you're just getting involved in this work team now, that's great, but we encourage you to go back and look at some of that um, background material on the website as well. Okay, so half of you were on the last webinar. That's great. And, and looks like a lot of you also had the opportunity to check out the recording and a few new folks as well. All right, moving on to my next slide here. What we did at that meeting on June 12th was to prioritize outcomes um, and narrow down to a set of three. So we reviewed the pros and cons of eight options 
and we'll pull up that list in a minute here. Okay. There we go. This is the list of outcomes that we talked about at that June 12th meeting and, and also um, at the earlier small group discussion. And we knew we needed to narrow this down and prioritize. So we used this criteria to get us down to this list of three outcomes. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Um, we then worked with staff at the Department of Health to identify these specific indicators that best align with the criteria for these outcomes. So this is the list that we're going to be working from today. In a minute, we're going to open it up for discussion, but I'll provide some background on targets and priority populations first. And for those of you who are planning to participate in several of these target setting webinars um, this week and next week, um, this material I'm gonna cover uh, now, I am gonna repeat on each of these webinars so that everybody uh, has the same information to start from. So if you are planning to join several of these and you don't wanna hear me give the same spiel <laughs> several times in a row, um, you might wanna join the webinars um, a little bit later into the, into the process. All right, so this is our um, SMART objectives. Um, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with SMART objectives. Here are some examples from the previous SHIP. Today we're focusing on the targets on the far right column and also the priority populations, which are those orange rows. And this is an example of what it looks like when we report out on progress toward these targets. And the purpose of setting targets for access to care indicators is so that we can monitor and report out on these indicators over time. So we are working on developing smart objectives like this for access to care so we can report out on access to care like this. So that's where we're headed today. Looking at the components of a SMART objective, um, specific and measurable refers to the indicator and the source. We've already done the work for this for access. That's the list of outcomes and indicators I just shared. Achievable and realistic refers to the target data value, and that's what we're going to be talking about more today. Time bound refers to the specific years for the baseline and the target data. And we've set 2022 as the target year for all objectives in this ship. And the baselines will vary somewhat depending on the data source. It's worth spending a bit more time talking about these two words, achievable and realistic. We think it's also important to be aspirational. So there's sort of a tension here between being achievable and realistic versus being aspirational. As we set targets, it could look like this, where we focus more on being aspirational and really reaching for the stars and how we set our targets and goals. Or it could be a more incremental approach that may be more realistic or we could strike a balance uh, where we would look at what seems achievable given current trends, but then reach a bit and push it um, to reach for better outcomes than we would see with the status quo. We would love to hear your thoughts on this balance um, and other considerations for setting targets. So we've got some discussion questions for you here. Um, the first question is, when setting ship targets, do you think the emphasis should be on um, being achievable and realistic or being aspirational or striking a balance between the two and why? And now we want to encourage you to raise your hand. We would love to see um, 
We'd love to hear from you. And so if you raise your hand, we will unmute you so you can talk to the group. Alternatively, you can also use the question box if you wanna type in um, responses to the question. So again, the question is, when setting ship targets, do you think the emphasis should be on achievable and realistic targets or aspirational targets or a balance between the two and why? So we're gonna give you a minute here to um, raise your hand. Okay, and I've got a question in the question box. Um, may have missed this information. Where did the data from mental health come? Have we used indicators used by the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for baseline measures? We did um, work with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, when we were um, selecting these outcomes and indicators, and also Dr. Hurst, um, who was previously with Ohio Boss, is now with the Department of Health, and so he, he was able to help us out as well. Okay, and then um, input from Chip here, achievable seems to be more practical. Okay. Another comment here from um, Karina, striking a balance, but more on the side of achievable and realistic. From Ilka, I think it's important to have realistic and achievable targets. Aspirational is important too for future outlook. I would say 70% realistic targets and 30% inspirational. Okay, looks like we may have a hand raised. Okay, Dr. Winslow. Winslow. Yeah, I, I just like a balance between the two. I think it's good to be realistic and we have to be that way. But I sure like to shoot for aspirational targets when we're doing these type efforts um, because it seems like if you set your expectations uh, higher that you actually have a better chance of achieving higher expectations. So I'd like to shoot for a little bit more than what we know is uh, just plain realistic. All right, thank you for that. And we've got some more, oh, another hand raised. Brittany, go for it. Hello, good morning. Um, I agree with Dr. Wimslow. I was thinking at the state level, maybe it could make sense to be more aspirational. Um, however, at the local level, because urban communities and rural versus Appalachian are so very different, something like looking at the number of providers that that we have, um, if if one of my rural communities gets one more provider, that would really change the percentage where it would take multiple providers in my urban community to do so. I also think it's much harder in the rural communities to bring in more providers. So as a state, when we're combining all urban, rural, and everything in between, I think a big, nice, huge goal that we all reach for would be great, but as long as the locals are not being held to that at the individual county level, possibly. Great, thank you, Brittany. I think that's a, an important point to think about um, state level targets versus local level targets. And that's certainly an issue when we look at some of these access indicators. And I think um, having, having a different look at the local level makes a lot of sense and making sure that's tailored to urban versus rural or other considerations for communities. Okay, we've got some more comments here um, from Anna. A balance between the two more attainable goals can be short-term over the course of the ship timeline, but aspirational should guide more long-term goals. Tanya, uh, particularly given our results with the last ship, realistic is needed. And then from Chesre, I agree that balance is great, but we should be more aspirational at the state level because aspiration inspires innovation and we wanna be more innovative to improve population health. From Jody, we should be aspirational, especially when we're looking at the fact that Ohio looks good with regard to access, but in reality, we need more mental health professionals across the board. All right, that's all really helpful feedback, and I don't think we have any more hands raised. So I'm gonna to go to our next discussion question. So now we wanna hear from you on, you can answer all three of these questions or just pick one that you wanna to respond to. What experiences have you had with setting targets in your organization or community? 
Have you had any experiences with setting targets that were too ambitious or not ambitious enough? And what are the lessons learned to inform the ship? So here's where we would love to hear from some local communities that maybe have experience setting uh, targets in their um, chips or implementation strategies or from state agencies that have had experiences with setting targets. What have you learned from that experience? And we encourage you to raise your hands. We'd love to hear some more voices. I'm sure there are folks out there who have had experiences with setting targets. And if it went really well, we want to hear about that. If it, if, you, if it didn't go so well, if you had some maybe some unintended consequences or things that didn't quite turn out the way you thought they would, let us know. Okay, we have a hand raised. Dr. Wimslow, go for it. Well, setting a, a goal for like colorectal cancer screening, which seems like it needs to improve across the board, uh, we did that in our association and we set a pretty high goal. We were not able to achieve it, but we did have significant improvements. So, you know, I, I, we probably were, were more aspirational in our target we set, but that, even though it wasn't achieved, was still inspiring enough to people that they it demonstrated about a 25% improvement over the couple of years that we really put that forward. So I, I still like the idea of shooting for more than probably even seems at times realistic just to get people really seriously engaged at a level that's going to be higher than if you just set a small goal and it's easily attained. So. Uh, um, my experience was that people did not criticize us for not hitting our target, but instead got into a bit higher gear because it looked like it would be difficult to get there. Hey, thanks for that example of how aspirational targets can uh, motivate change and progress. Another hand raised. Chip, go for it. Chip, go ahead. All right, we're not hearing you, Chip. Uh, make sure you've put in your audio pin. Looks like you have. Make sure you're unmuted. Okay, we'll... Um, Okay, Ann Spicer, um, you need to put in your audio pin to be able to speak. Okay, and I'm not seeing any other comments in the question box. Um, oh, here we go. Here's a comment from Jody. I worked in two county rural areas and we set goals that were not reached, but it helped us to identify barriers and solutions for those barriers. So another example of setting an aspirational target and how that can be useful. Okay, comment from Hope. When we possibly can, it may be good to set our goals similarly to those of healthy people or other national plans. Um, yeah, I think um, the, our, our timing is slightly awkward in that Healthy People 30, 2030 is in development, but we can certainly um, take a look at Healthy People 2020 targets as a reference point. And if folks are aware of other national targets and benchmarks that would be relevant for our access to care indicators here, um, please let us know what those are so we can make sure we're consulting those too. Okay, and Chip has his hand raised. Chip, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. My microphone wasn't working. Um, when we're talking about setting goals uh, at the state level and even how that translates at the local level, I think we have to be careful that we have local level data. So for example, uh, CDC has a lot of very good data at the census track levels through the 500 cities project. But a lot of that data is not available uh, in many of our Appalachian counties. And so I, you know, I think that when we set data, we have to make sure that as much as possible, um, it's available for um, all parts of the state, or at least 
we have to make some provisions of how can we do small area estimates in areas in which um, data is not currently available. And the, the second thing I think that um, kind of balances this issue of being practical versus aspirational is that if we were to set a goal, um, the one that just comes to mind is infant mortality, for example. How do we make sure that when we set a goal that we provide the type of assistance so that our partners and local communities can determine how much of that goal can they actually reach? Uh, there are epidemiological methods that we can employ so that if we set a goal, we would actually be able to really determine um, what is each county's, in a sense, fair share of how much can they really be expected to contribute to that goal? And so I think that if we have those type of considerations out there, we won't set, in a sense, certain communities up for failure because we set goals that they really can't achieve because they may not even have the critical mass in terms of population to achieve those goals. All right, thank you, Chip. Yeah, the importance of local data here and, and making sure that um, as much help is provided as necessary to local communities that are aligning to the ship so that they can um, not only set targets that make sense for them, but also achieve those targets. And we have another hand raised. Uh, Brittany, go ahead. Hi, just um, two thoughts. Um, one would be, I, I, I work in about 50 counties, and I have seen where when a chip is done, the community is working together. Sometimes <clears throat> some of the priorities are doing really well and the others aren't. And I feel that it's come just down to the leadership at the county level. Um, some counties have really, really strong mental health board directors. Some have really strong health commissioners, CEOs of the hospital, whatever that might be. And if you can find a local leader that's willing to push whatever it is that and really, really work towards it, put money towards it in time. Those are definitely the ones that you can see them meeting their goals. I would also say, I've been doing this for 15 years, and in some of the communities that have some of the same coalition members, they've been working together for 15 years, three years is so hard to see something happen. And so when those who have kept pressing on past three years, six years, nine, 12, now they're seeing some huge, um, you know, priority areas, I mean, really dropping their numbers in certain areas. But I think it's hard when we do it for three years and then all the players change again and the priorities change again. I feel as if we're never going to see anything in some communities. But those that have just pressed on with the same evidence-based strategies, looking at the same indicators over time, they do see things um, in seven years, 10 years, but three years is just so hard. And I know that's what we're tasked with. We don't have a choice, um, but I, I, I do think we sometimes need to look over a six year period or nine year period to really see if we've made a difference. Yeah, thanks Brittany. I think that speaks to the importance of continuity and, and maintaining some of, the, some of the same indicators and outcomes over time. In the interest of time, because um, we have more ground we need to cover, I'm gonna move us along. Um, but please continue to type things into the question box. We are able to download everything that we get in the question box. So if I'm not able to respond to everything, um, don't worry, we, we are able to include everything that you add there into our notes for this webinar. I'm gonna move us to the next slide here. Okay, now um, I wanna talk about priority populations. Um, so again, these are groups that are experiencing worse outcomes than the overall population. And these are examples of the priority populations that were included in the last ship. We looked at race, ethnicity, age, gender, income, education, disability status, and geography. Um, and that varied depending on what was available from the data source. Um, some data sources don't provide any population group breakouts. In a minute, Zach is gonna share 
um, the data that we have for the access indicators so that we can see which groups are experiencing the worst outcomes for access. And then we'll ask for your input on which priority populations um, should be included in the next SHIP for access. Then we're going to talk about setting targets for priority populations. And there's a few different ways that we can think about doing that. To illustrate two ways of setting priority population targets, I'm going to use this apple tree metaphor that some of you may have seen um, elsewhere for describing equity and equality. And in these pictures, the apples represent optimal health outcomes, the ground represents the social, economic, and physical environment, and the crates are policies and programs and other resources. In this image, all three people have the same policies and programs, but two of them can't reach the optimal outcomes because of where they're starting from. In the second one, the apple crates are tailored and targeted so that everyone achieves optimal health outcomes. This is what equity looks like. Now we're going to use this picture to talk about two ways to set targets for priority populations. In the first approach, universal targets, we would set the same target for everyone. The apple would be at the same level. So for example, the target for the black infant mortality rate would be the same as the target for the overall infant mortality rate. This approach makes the case that we must eliminate disparities and inequities, and it's consistent with the goal of achieving equity. To be effective, it needs to drive targeted allocation of resources, funding, and power. In other words, the targets are universal, but the strategies, those apple crates, need to be targeted and tailored with more resources directed towards groups that have the furthest to go to reach the apple. And then in the second approach, um, we would vary the targets by population. So here, the population, priority population targets would be set based on trends and baseline data and may therefore be different from the overall population targets. This approach is not really consistent with the goal of achieving equity, but it is seen as being more realistic. Um, so this is kind of bringing us back to that question of achievable and realistic versus aspirational. We would love to hear your thoughts on this. So again, we have a discussion question for you. We encourage you to raise your hand. The first question is, which approach to setting priority population targets do you think would be best to use in the ship? The universal target approach where we have the same target for all groups or the population varied target approach where we have different targets for different groups? And let's see if we have any hands raised. Okay, Chip, go ahead. So, you know, this is Chip. I think the universal targets um, are okay, but I think that where well, the tricky part is, is doing the same for all groups. So for example, having a target, uh, I'll go back to this example of infant mortality. We spend a lot of money on infant mortality and based on our latest data, the um, infant mortality has improved for white infants, but it's not, um, but it has not improved as much as we would like for black infants. And so if we wanna actually have a universal target that actually in a sense is designed to raise um, the level for all groups who are impacted disproportionately by different diseases, that makes sense. But the trick is not doing the exact same intervention for all groups. I think that's, that's where we fall short. So that's just my perspective. Thank you. Yeah, the challenge is the apple crate part of the equation, and that definitely needs more attention. Okay, got a um, comment here from Ilka. Definitely population varied targets. It's a must to get more accurate data. And then from Jody varied by population, then look at tools, technology-based, increasing access within primary care, et cetera. We have another hand raised. Dr. Wimslow, go ahead. Yeah, I'm with uh, Chip on his comment. That is, we should, if we're going to set universal targets, we need to proportion resources appropriately to achieve universal targets. And that's what we haven't done in the past. 
we really haven't uh, established resources that are dedicated towards getting at the real disparity issues in a way that would allow us to achieve the universal outcome. So if we aren't going to uh, reapportion our resources, we shouldn't set universal targets and think we're going to be successful in reaching those. Yeah, so the resources have to match the targets. Oh, another hand raised from Hope. Go ahead, Hope. Hi, yes. Um, I agree that the population varied targets would be ideal. I think it might be difficult to measure the outcomes uh, unless we have data from a single source that includes all of the different subpopulations, we might not be able to know for sure that any differences we're seeing or any targets that we're meeting are truly comparable if it's from different data sets. Yeah, and when, when Zach um, shares the data, he'll be um, showing the sources that we have, and we would definitely want to use the same, same source consistently um, for different groups. And another hand raised. Brittany? Hi. Um, one thought. I think if we're looking at this access to care specifically for rural versus urban, the population varied targets almost have to be there. Um, we can't really do it the other way. I also don't think any of us, I live in the boonies on a horse and cattle ranch. At no point in time when I moved out here did I think I was going to have a level one trauma center right next door or, you know, every type of specialist and primary care provider at my fingertips. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think when you move out to a rural community, you know you have to drive to some of those places. And where we live, it's very hard to find people that don't even have cars. You don't even move out here if you don't have one. So transportation typically doesn't even come up as the main issue, believe it or not. So I think I would not want our goals. I, I work in Toledo and I live in a rural community. I would not want those goals to be the same. On the other side, um, I know we were, we, we've been criticized before because infant mortality specifically, why would the goals not be the same? Why would we not want to have those same goals for white versus African-American versus Hispanic babies? Why would we lower our standards for different races or ethnicities? And we were criticized for that. So I kind of see both sides, but it really depends what the indicator is we're talking about, I think. Yeah. All right. Thank you. This has all been really helpful input, and I see we have some more comments in the comment boxes, but I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read those out right now. We do have um, just a few more questions that I want to get to before turning it over to Zach. So any other suggestions um, for addressing equity in the target setting process? And are there any other issues that should be considered in setting priority population targets? So any issues that we haven't already talked about that anyone wants to comment on? All right, then I am going to transition um, over to Zach, who's going to get into some of the details on the data. Take it away, Zach. Thank you, Amy. And um, again, thank you so much for participating in this uh, discussion today. I'm going to review our objective again, which is to gather evidence, or excuse me, guidance to finalize our targets, priority populations, and targets for those priority populations for the access to care indicators. Um, the desired outcomes that we selected were increase health insurance coverage, increase local access to health care providers, and reduce unmet need for mental health care. Um, after our last work team meeting, we consulted with subject matter experts to land on the indicators you see listed here. And then the format for this segment of the meeting is going to be that I'll review data related to each of the indicators for each one of the three desired outcomes, and then we'll ask a series of questions about each indicator. So the first outcome is increased health insurance coverage. 
the two indicators that we have from the American Community Survey one-year estimates are the percent of 19 to 64 year olds who are uninsured and for children the percent of um, children under the age of 18 or excuse me ages 0 to 18 who are uninsured again from the ACS one year Just a few factors to consider as we're looking at this data. Um, in 2017, 8% of adults and 4.5% of children were uninsured. Um, this was lower than the US average for adults, 8% in Ohio compared to 12, per, excuse me, 12% in the US. And for children, 4.5% compared to 5% in the US. Um, the general trend of uninsured rates has been down, although rates for children um, do seem to be stabilizing. So our first discussion question is, what factors do you think are important to consider when we set targets for each of those indicators, both adult and child? Uh, thinking about measurement issues, federal, state, or local policies or policy changes, broader trends in, in insurance rates, and then any other issues you think we ought to consider as we set those targets. So again, we'll encourage you to raise your hand. If you're unable to or don't want to talk on the call, you can also enter um, any comments into the question box. Okay. Um, Chip noted that there are some federal, state, and local policy issues to consider related to health insurance coverage. Any other thoughts? Doesn't look like we have anybody raising their hand. We're uh, typing any thoughts into the question box. Uh, there certainly are things happening at the federal, state, and local level, um, and this may be indicators where people will have more input when we get to strategy discussions in August. Okay. All right. The next segment of the discussion will be about selecting priority populations for each of these indicators. Um, these metrics are new to the ship in 2020. So to identify the groups that we displayed on the slide, we looked at data by race, race and ethnicity, age, sex, income, education, and disability status. Um, and then the populations that you see listed had an uninsured rate that was at least 10% worse than the Ohio overall average. Not 10 percentage points, but 10% worse. Uninsured rates for all groups in Ohio have gone down and stabilized in recent years. However, there are many groups that still have rates that are much higher than the overall rate. Uh, by race, these groups include Black Ohioans and Ohioans who are Hispanic or Latino. And by income, Ohioans with incomes below 138% of poverty, uh, which is the Medicaid cutoff for adults. Um, and then again, groups with uh, incomes between 138% per, of poverty and 399% of poverty also have a higher rate than the overall. For children, the groups that experience disparities are uh, children who are Hispanic or Latino, and then children in households with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level. Again, the approximate uh, Medicaid eligibility threshold for children in the state of Ohio. So now with that data in mind, we'd like to pose these two questions to you. What factors do you think are important to consider in identifying the priority populations for each of these indicators? And then which priority population should be selected for each indicator? Again, please raise your hand if you'd like to talk, um, or you can type your questions into the question box. 
In the interest of time, we haven't been reading a lot of what's been coming into the question box, but please know um, that all of those comments will be considered as we do the work um, based on what we hear on the call. Okay, we do have one comment here that it would be helpful to provide a column with a measure of how many people would have to be impacted to achieve the target. Um, so that would sort of be another statement uh, of the target. For example, to reduce the uninsured rate to 5% for this group, um, X number of people would have to become uninsured. That would give some real grounding uh, to the goals. We do have a hand raised. Shane, you can go ahead and talk. Yeah, I think my biggest question on this when we talk about the populations is we're not looking at their locations. Um, or I didn't see anything with location. So going back to the rural urban Appalachian um, questions of how are we isolating that type of information? Right, so um, this data from the American Community Survey is available um, down at the local level. Uh, we did not look at the disparity between urban and rural or uh, suburban counties uh, when we looked at this data. So, but, but we could, um, and this is a measure where uh, from the ACS the data is available. In some cases for rural counties, you might have to look at five years of pooled data in order to get estimates. Okay, so the feedback generally seems to be focused on the need to somehow integrate geography um, into looking at these metrics. All right. Okay, um, so now we're going to move on to two poll questions about priority populations. Uh, we are going to ask you to select one. Uh, so what priority population should be selected for uninsured adults? Uh, knowing that again, we will take this guidance about the urban and rural into account, we would like you to vote by selecting one of the options below. Again, no final decisions are being made. We're trying to gather input on the general feeling of the group. Please do go ahead and vote. Again, not making final decisions, just trying to get a sense of where the group's at with these options. Okay, we'll go ahead and show those poll results. So generally more support for the uh, priority population segmented out by income rather than race. Thank you very much for your input. And now we'll move on to a second poll question, this time about uninsured children. What priority population should be selected for uninsured children? Again, please select one option. No final decisions. Your input is valued. Go ahead and vote so we can show you the results here. Again, general sense that the support is for a priority population segmented by household income. Thank you very much again for your input. All right. So 
So the next outcome is increase local access to healthcare services. After some discussion with subject matter experts at the Ohio Department of Health, we settled on these metrics from the list that you saw on our last webinar. Just for some background, health professional shortage areas are geographically or demographically defined areas that are underserved by either primary care, mental health, or dental health care professionals. Uh, these two particular indicators do have some limitations for tracking progress over time, and this is because health professional shortage areas, or HIPSAs, are not often withdrawn, so we would not expect to see these numbers to change dramatically over time. Um, that said, these indicators will be replaced with indicators from the minimum data set, which is currently being collected um, and under development and will be available, um, and then indicators that can be more precisely tracked over time will be re uh, used to replace these indicators. Because these metrics are essentially placeholders, we aren't going to have any further discussion on them on this webinar. The next outcome is reduce unmet need for mental health care. The metrics selected for this outcome measure the actual receipt of treatment uh, for people with mental health needs. The adult metric measures unmet need for adults who have a mental illness and perceive a need for treatment. The youth metric measures excuse me, measures treatment for all uh, youth with a major depressive episode. As seen in the online Shaw, Ohio does perform similarly to or better than the US on all of these metrics. And then it's also important to note as we think about tracking these metrics that they use three pooled years of data from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health and that can present some limitations for tracking the impact of policy change in the short term. Um, there's also a, a challenge in tracking data from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health on the local level or for priority populations. So now we'll move on to just one discussion question about these indicators which is what factors do you think are important to consider when setting targets for each of the mental, excuse me, um, yes, mental health care uh, metrics. Measurement, federal, state, and local policy changes, broader trends, or other issues. I'll just flip back here to the data slide as we unpack this conversation. Again, please raise your hand if you have comments or type into the question box. Dr. Winslow, you can go ahead and talk to us, please. Yeah, this is Ted Winslow. Yeah, it seems like most of the information we've been uh, receiving recently has been about suicide uh, rate uh, in both adolescents and in adults. So this focuses on who is not receiving any treatment, uh, but what we oftentimes see is sort of like um, uh, like we saw with opiates. We oftentimes got the uh, uh, unintentional overdose death rates, but it left out of, I guess, our perspective, the huge amount of uh, use and abuse that was going on below that. So although we hear mostly suicide rates, I think this is probably a better indicator of general um, mental health uh, that, that we're using here. So I'm in favor of keeping this if, if we feel it's a valid measure versus look at the rates of suicide, which may or may not be indicative of, of how much underlying uh, problem we're uh, needing to address. Right. Um, thank you for that comment and uh, suicide both youth and adult are outcome excuse me indicators that will be tracked in the uh, mental health and addiction topic area so this is a really good example of those health factors driving the health outcomes that we're we're tracking in the ship so thank you for the comment not seeing any other uh, hands raised
There is one comment here that we need to be considerate of how treatment is defined um, in these metrics and at least being clear about that. But without seeing any other hands raised or comments related to this question, I think what I'll do at this point is uh, hand over the slides, the control to Aragina to close out the webinar. Thank you, Zach. So moving forward, HPIO is going to send out a link um, to the final SMART objectives list with all targets by August. The next meeting for the Access to Care work group will be in person at HPIO on Tuesday, July 30th from 10 a.m. into 12 p.m. Uh, during this meeting, we're going to focus on strategy selection and have small group sorry, small group discussions. Um, so in-person attendance is needed because this is going to be a highly interactive meeting as we always have at HPIO. Um, there won't be a call-in option. The agenda for the strategy selection meeting will be posted uh, as you see here on HPIO Shawship webpage. You're going to also be able to get the uh, directions needed um, if this is your first time coming to HPIO and parking information. And just a fun fact before we end today's webinar, uh, today is National Give Something Away Day. So remember, all of you can always give a smile. We thank you for your participation and engagement and discussion and hope that you guys have a great rest of the day. Thank you.